Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored to welcome to the show from the town of Inuvik, Northwest Territories, Deputy Mayor Natasha Kulikowski. Natasha, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. So, Natasha, I want to start with the big question that I've asked every single municipal politician who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Um, I would say it goes back to a little bit in childhood. Um, my parents were immigrants to Canada. Um, both of their families came at different times, and um, we're always very happy to be Canadians, and so things like uh, we used to go with our parents to the polls to vote. Um, when I turned 18, it just happened to be a uh, provincial election year. And so I got to go and vote right away. Um, and then as I kind of grew into an adult and I was here in Inuvik and working in the community, I was doing a lot of volunteer work. Um, and from volunteer work, that led to some board work, which then led to, well, if you want to see change happen, you need to be in positions of change. Um, so I decided that I would put my name forward for council in my first election. I lost by one vote, which um, taught me and everyone I know uh, the importance of voting. Um, and uh, and then over time developed uh, um, more confidence in the matter. I was actually appointed as a councillor after the passing of another councillor. Um, and then following that appointment, I was uh, elected in the next election and then as mayor in the following and then now as deputy mayor in this this last one. So, so there's a there's a journey and a half. So let's let's go yeah. on that journey together, <laughs> Natasha. Sure. I want to start with the, your childhood. Um, you talk about the provincial election that uh, happened when you turned 18. Um, I know from my own background that municipal politics and municipal governance while there it wasn't discussed as much as provincial and federal politics was that similar to you or did you have a a, a good understanding on the all three levels of jurisdictions uh, when it comes to government i would say at 18 i had the social studies 20 understanding of of the three levels <laughs> and you know how to draw a picture of parliament from social class kind of thing <laughs> Um, uh, so I grew up in Edmonton and we lived on a very busy street. So we did have like at one point, um, they were trying to make it a truck route and we were part of, um, some folks that are, are I shouldn't say we are family. What, and my, it would have been my parents cause they were the people of age, 
um, decided to put a no truck route sign on our yard. And I did an interview with CD CTV when I was, I don't know, like 13 or something about why we had that sign in our yard. And so um, I think I was, I was turned on to how you can affect change or stop change that you don't want to see by being active in, in community. Now you are the the most northern councillor or elected official I've ever had on this show. I have many people from across this country who have come on and sat in your same position and chatted about their journey about to elected office. So I've got to ask, how does someone from Edmonton become the mayor and then deputy mayor of a town at the most northern part of the Northwest Territories? Because I I, I, uh, I, I don't see the uh, correlation here of between going from Edmonton to a small town in the Northwest Territories. And I can totally understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my folks had lived here in the late 80s. Uh, sorry, the late 70s and early 80s. And so my brother and I were both born here. Uh, and then my parents opted to move back to Edmonton, which is where they were both raised uh, when we were just toddlers. And so okay. I always heard about Inuvik. We always had friends come and visit. Um, it was, you know, just part of our lives always. Stories we told, pieces of art we had, all of that. Uh, and then after I graduated high school, my mom, I was about a year out working at a movie theater, doing a little bit of uh, visiting the local pubs, you might say. And uh, my mom just said, you know, I don't, I know you're not ready for school, but I think you should go do something. I don't care what it is. And so I called a family friend up here and uh, said, can I come check out Anuvik? And she said, sure, I'll give you a job and a place to stay. And so I came up from May to Christmas of 01, loved it. Uh, had a, had another job in that time. I moved back to the city uh, for two months. So I, I did Christmas at home and then I was back up here by February and never properly left again other than for holidays. It's, I, I, I just fell in love with the place. I loved the freedom and the, just so much of everything that I was doing here. It was so different, of course, than being at home and having just gotten out of school looking for an adventure or something different to do. And this was you know, pretty much as far, well, it was as far as you could drive at that time. So <laughs> had you ever, had you ever, ever thought to yourself in that time frame from going up to a new Vic, visiting it, going back to Edmonton, coming back that maybe I'll one day run for municipal government and be on council. When did that sort of light switch happen in your head to say, okay, this is the, as you basically said the natural progressive uh, stepping stone here to move in from if you want change you get involved so when did the light switch go off to say okay natasha it's your turn let's let's put your name forward yeah it certainly wasn't uh something i thought of as a teenager or early on um i think the biggest stepping stone i think for me was i had i was doing lots of volunteering at our local legion and um, eventually I had been so active at the Legion that a few people said, why don't you put your name forward for the executive board? And so I did. Um, and so I think that was actually the catalyst that sent me towards municipal politics and that working on the board and seeing how decisions are made um, and how, you know, a lot of times boards of places have the old guard in place. And if you're coming in as a young person, it's kind of tough to to make change or to really influence much. But um, but I understood from being on that board and from the little bit of success that I had had that I could do more with it. And so I think that's where it came from. The, the family friend that brought me up originally, she had been a mayor or deputy mayor in the past and had been on council a lot. So I think having a female role model as well that was in that kind of position kind of gave me that little boost that, yeah, I could probably do that too. So what was the year that you decided to first put your name forward in uh, the municipal elections in Inuvik? I think it was 2012. So that's the election, unfortunately, that you lost by one vote. That's right. Yeah. To <laughs> so, the current mayor. <laughs> to, uh, to, hopefully you're good friends now. Hopefully oh, yeah. you know our feelings. So I, I want to know, you're volunteering at the Legion. You, you kind of have an understanding of what the issues are in your community. 
But you decide, and this is the big thing that people can ask you, but you ultimately have to make that decision. What put you on that path to say, Natasha's voice needs to be at that council table. Natasha needs to be there because while I can make changes at a volunteer base through the Legion, through different nonprofit organizations, council is where the big changes happen. What was going on in the community that you finally said to yourself, my voice needs to be at that table? That's a really good question. Um, or was it was there nothing? Was it just a natural stepping stone, like you said? Yeah, I think it was more of a stepping stone and a an involvement. Like I I had I had the time, right? Because it's a dedication of time. I had the interest. I had the um the support. Like I had friends and who I would call family and community members who were telling me to go for it and things like that. So I think it was kind of an all around decision. It, I don't think there was any one thing. There definitely wasn't any single platform item that I ran on or anything like that. It was more about representing community. And as time has gone on in my um, time in politics, I've become more and more um, concerned or advocating for more women in politics too and the the way that our voices um need to be amplified and we need to just have more women at the table so so yeah the, you, i yeah i guess there's no straight answer there but <laughs> no there's no straight answer but it brings up a good question of that election while there was no burning issue for yourself to say okay this or this is why i'm getting involved do you remember if the, there was a burning issue in the community, whether it be the progress that needed to happen in the community, whether it be a new library, more roads? What was going on at the time that you can remember? Were they more micro issues like individual people bringing their individual issues or was it the issues that the town was facing as a whole as well? Well, so in 2012, well, up to going back in time a little bit. So Inuvik and this area have always been kind of a boom and bust economy because of oil and gas exploration. And so in the Welcome early to 2000s, Alberta. Yeah, well, right. <laughs> yeah. So when I came up in 2001, it was booming. There was, in the wintertime, there were 17 work camps out in the Delta. There was busy, busy. There was 10 bars. There was, you know, five hotels. There was all, it was busy, busy, busy all the time. Uh, and then in 2007, the decision came back from the JR, from the joint review panel about having a pipeline here or not. And they had said yes, but their decision took, I think, two years longer than anticipated. And so, you know, what happened in 2007 to 2010 is the big uh, recession and everything worldwide. Uh, so the oil companies, oil and gas companies decided at that time, we won't move forward with a project right now, which took us into a a uh, bust. And so definitely economics would have been on the uh, on the table. I think anything to try to generate um, more economies in our community that don't depend on oil and gas. And that's something that we still talk about. How do we expand those opportunities? Um, because the world market isn't looking for what we're sitting on right now. And so, um, yeah, so I think that would have been the major issue on the 20 in 2012 and it continues to be today. I was going to ask that question to follow up to that in the subsequent election since 2012, the ones that you uh, were, were successful in, has it been more of the macro issues of the economy or has it been sort of more micro issues? And don't get me wrong. There are, I'm assuming micro issues that are at play with because everyone has their personal opinion on how municipalities should be run or should operate. But for you, are you saying that there's more macro issues at play for your community than micro issues? Um, I think it's probably that mix because there's so many things at, at a municipal level that we want to say we want to fix, but it's not our level to fix. So we can advocate for it. And so the the macro becomes micro to our process, right? Um, but certainly things like development, um, whether that's business development, property development, anything like that, are always things that that are brought up in our in our in our um, debates. And then down to things like when are we going to finish replacing all the garbage bins, right? Like it's across the gamut of what of what we're doing. And I think that's pretty typical of municipal um, 
you know, things people want us to fix mental health. Well, you know, first of all, it's not our, our jurisdiction, but second of all, it's going to take all of us, right? So it's uh, me as an individual counselor or mayor can't, I can't fix it all. But, uh, but yeah, so it, uh, right across the board. You brought up a statement and I want to stick on it for a few seconds about getting more women involved in politics, especially at the municipal level. Now, I, I've sat down with many women from across Canada, one in particular by the name of Councillor Trina Appleby in Newfoundland and Labrador, who sits in, who's uh, the former deputy mayor, now Councillor of Torbay, Newfoundland and Labrador. And I want to know, why do you think, and this is your opinion, this is not the general consensus, but why do you believe more women aren't getting involved at the municipal level? Or do you believe uh, that I they think... are? I don't think they are. I Well, one, if we had a choice of 10, we're getting one, if, if that makes sense. Like yep. one person can make it work for their family, for their life, for their time. Um, so many of the barriers that like that have been happening for years and years are still in existence. Mo you know, women are typically the um, caregiver at home. Um, their their expectations of their time just in the general family unit are different than than a, a man's. Um, and I think that there's some progress sometimes for those things. Um, but, you know, it's still it's still hard when. You know, you can't even if I don't think councils have um, um, when you have a child, you don't get like time off. Like if you miss so many meetings, you're it's kind of it, right? Like yeah. so, those things aren't happening. Not that we're full time either, so that's that's a little bit different than in other areas. But I mean, still, there's just so many demands on women, and it's uh, you know, it's have, a lot. And yeah, have so, you seen progress? since you first were elected to to 2023 have you seen progress on the because i i in i, I i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna apologize right now because i love these conversations because i never know which way they're gonna go and i love talking <laughs> about things that our people are passionate about and it sounds like you are from the conversation that you this from the statement you said do you see the progress that needs to happen happening in Canada when it gets comes to getting more uh, women and females uh, elected or even getting them their names on the ballot? Because that's the first step, not even getting them elected. It's getting them on the ballot first off. Yeah, it's uh, so uh, from just a numerical point, we've made progress in our community in that when I first ran in that election, there was three women on the ballot and two got in. In the previous election, we had myself and two women on the ballot and all three of us got in. And then now this time, there's two of us that were elected as councillors in the original election. We had a by-election and a third woman put her name forward. So there's three of us again. So we're ahead of where we were when I started. It would be great to see parity. Um, but, you know, that's that's something we're working towards. Again, it, with the volunteer base in our community having a population of only like 3,300 people, a lot of the women that you hope would put their names forward are already on the other boards. They're running the DEA, they're on the daycare board, they're uh, minor hockey, right? Like their their volunteer time is already being taken up with family business and other items. So as much as we would love to have them come for council, they've dedicated that time to those things. Now, the hope is maybe in 10 years when their kids are graduating and they don't have to do minor hockey or the school anymore, that then they'll move to to council. Right. But they also might just want to break from everything at that point. Right. So how do we get people in the meantime to come forward? And there is some good initiatives. The G government of the Northwest Territories puts on a campaign school for women. Um, and I took part in that in 2015, I believe it was. Um, and it was great. It was just really good information and having like people to bounce questions off of that have been through it and whatever. And we have another one coming up next week, actually. Oh. So because there's a territorial election this fall and then municipal elections will be next in 2024. So um, hopefully we can garner some strength, some women to come out and listen. And then I'll be at their dinner to talk about what my experiences have been. And actually both the, both of our counselors are going to come as well, I think. So 
Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't North the Northwest Territories just go through a municipal election, or are the municipal elections in Yellowknife different from everywhere else in the the territory? Yellowknife is on a four year, okay, um, which they decided in their the last election, and we're on a three year uh, okay. as cities, towns, and villages. Now the hamlets and charter communities are every year, and like so, it's yeah. There's always an election in the NWT. <laughs> I want to turn to uh, the role of a counselor as a whole now, because every time you walk into that council chambers, you have to be informed on what the administration wants. You have to be engaged with the community on what they want as well. But at the end of the day, you have to make the final decision and you have to either say yay or nay to whatever's going on in the community and what's presented to you at council. How much weight do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to be informed of what you're voting on, engaged in the community on what their wants and needs are, but not cemented in the idea of where how you're going to vote until you raise your hand and that vote is called for? Yeah, I, it's it's pretty weighty. I mean, it depends on the on the item as well, right? On things like a you know, a simple change to a bylaw because of, you know, a technicality, of course, it's easy to raise your hand when it's uh, something that really affects the public. And, the, you know, most of the time when it's when it's the bigger issues folks have expressed to you either in person or through text or social media or emails about what they think about what's going on. So you do have to pay attention to those things. Um, you li You listen, you hear what people have to say. Um, a big part of it also is is reading that council package and making sure that you have a good understanding of what the item is um, and bringing those questions to admin or to whoever the presentation is from to make sure that that all the information gets on the table as well in front of everybody. So like you say, you don't go in there with that decision made, even though you may even sometimes be leaning one way or another, but it's that that question and answer period that can really help to to form what what uh, what your opinion is going to be or what and then what your vote will be. Now, uh, to play devil's advocate with you, and I, sure. I love I love doing this because this is the this is the great thing about these <laughs> these type of conversations. Those those bylaw minute bylaw changes, like okay, yes, it's a simple yes or no. Um, Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, said it best. Municipal governments are the government of proximity. The decisions you make around the table, they change the day after. <laughs> like the right. day after they happen, you have to go out to your community and sell those ideas and they will impact your communities the next day. Um, is it hard to live in a small community like Inuvik and make decisions that will affect day-to-day -day lives of your community members and understand that you're not going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. And for those who are listening to this, the, the deputy mayor's uh, chuckling a little bit. So I'm assuming she understands and knows that not 100% of the people are going to be happy with what you do or say. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that's part of what you take on when you put your name forward. Um, it's it, Part of it also is that you know that the people who voted for you elected to put you into that seat to make these decisions. And that's a confidence that you need to have. They put you there. Um, and so you also hope that then those folks who are maybe not happy with your decision voted for one. Um, and there is the old adage that, you know, if you, if you don't get out and vote, you don't get to bitch. And, you know, like, so if someone is really fighting you on it, you can explain your side of it or council's decision, however it is. And you hope that, you know, even if they still don't agree with you, at least they heard what you have to say. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you, you take that on when you come into the role. It's something that I think in the beginning is a tough thing to learn. Um, also, like learning that you always have your counselor hat on. You don't get to just walk into a room and leave it somewhere else and put this one on. Your That hat stays there as well as all the other ones. Right. So, um, yeah. You ever just want to take terms. the hat off? Do you ever just want to take that counselor hat off and just go run to town or go run into a grocery store, the convenience <laughs> store and grab like a tank of gas or a carton of milk and say, okay, I'm going to run in, run out. But you know that you're going to be 20, 25 minutes sometimes even just picking up a carton of milk. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's okay with me. Cause I would much rather have someone come to me and tell me what their concern is 
then someone say, oh, she doesn't listen or she won't let me talk to her or whatever, right? So yeah, so as much as wearing the hat gets, you know, there are times when you wish you could take it off. It's what I signed up for and I'm totally okay with that. And when I'm not okay with that, that's when I don't put my name forward again, right? I want to turn to Anuvik as a whole. And before I ask this question, I want to pre preface this by saying this is a conversation between the deputy and mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. And it's her opinion. Deputy mayor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the community today? Probably the cost of energy. Um, heating mm -hmm. and power both are very high. And... Um, at our residents, while prices of everything else are going up, so are those. And it's um, almost to a point of being untenable for people. So how do you see your role as deputy mayor in advocating at the federal and provincial stages to help alleviate some of those issues? Because you and I both know that cost of living is going through the roof for not just the people in the Northwest Territories, not just the people in the town of Inuvik, but across this great country. How do you see your role in advocating to the provincial and federal or territorial and federal government, sorry, uh, in alleviating some of those challenges that people are facing in your community? So certainly using our voices to advocate to groups like the um, Northwest Territories Power Corporation, which is supposed to be an arm's length from the government of the Northwest Territories, but they regulate all of our um, power consumption um, and the processes in which they make power. So um, they're putting in a windmill. We have some, we have lots of solar in town. We have all kinds of things like that, but we're still using diesel backup and not coming off of that anytime soon, we're told. So uh, myself, whenever I'm advocating in front of them, I'm asking them why we can't start moving towards other things more. We're doing smaller, just towards getting off that diesel, towards bringing prices down, all of these things that, that just keep going up and up and up. Um, at a federal level, uh, I also sit on the Northwest Territories Association of Communities, so I do have an opportunity to go to Ottawa once a year to advocate to uh, ministers and others, members of parliament from the um, other parties as well. Um, and a big thing that we talk about also is, is um, energy, but it's supporting projects that are local um, that are going to be federally funded or partially funded. So currently, the one of the Indigenous governments here in our community, the Inuvaluate Regional Corporation, has a project online or po potentially online that's just waiting for some approvals. Um, that would mean bringing down that cost of diesel because they would, or of, ga of natural gas, because they'd actually be able to access some of what we're sitting on here. Um, but of course, it's stuck in federal red tape uh, bureaucracy fun times. So um... I've never heard it called <laughs> that before, but here we are in 2023. <laughs> So I make sure when we're there that that gets on the table so that if they've never heard about it before, they can go to that person sitting beside them later and say, like, what was that thing she said? How do we support that? Or how do we, you know, like, tell me more about it? Because it's a totally northern solution made in the north. And we need more of those. We advocate to Ottawa as well as to the GNWT as well, that if they're going to make decisions about a NUVIC to come to a NUVIC and see what it looks like and see what we are dealing with. Because to a lot of folks, we're just a little dot way up there on the map. Um, and they don't know what their realities are when we're here on the ground. So, I recently spoke to a mayor in British Columbia, and I asked him this question. And it sounds like I need to ask this question to you. <laughs> Do you feel like you're screaming into a void and the territorial governments and the federal governments just aren't listening to the issues that are going on in your community? Um, I wouldn't say a void. I think that there are ears out there listening. They've just they just might not be hitting the ears that that decide. Um, but I wouldn't say completely no. I think the priorities, um, particularly at a federal level of uh, things like green energy and things aren't just aren't realistic for the north. And I don't mean just Inuvik. I mean Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and Yukon. Um, the things designed for for Ottawa just don't work here. Um, and so like Heck, I'm assuming things that are designed in yellow for Yellowknife aren't 
good for the people of Nuvik as well. Like uh, we talk about the urban rural divide that, that we, we are seeing in this country. It's probably prominent as well in the Northwest Territories, isn't it? Absolutely. And so like in Anuvik, all of our buildings have to be built on things like pilings um, because you can't build straight on the ground because of the permafrost. So any building that is being built has to be at least, I think the minimum is five feet off the ground. Um, so that's already just design building a house is different than anywhere else, right? You have a utilidor system, which is a above ground water and sewer system that runs behind all our houses. And so we don't have any back alleys because everything, because that's where the sewer and water run. Every house that you build has to have a utility debt to connect to the utility. Like there's all these things that happen here that just don't happen anywhere else. Um, and from a municipal standpoint, things like um, infrastructure. So we have roads with heaving and, um, and uh, sorry, heaving and melting because of the permafrost again. So like you go down Wolverine Road and it's like you're in the old jalopy going around um, because of all the changes under the ground, right? Like this doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, and so when infrastructure dollars are like for putting a new you know, heat exchanger in the water treatment plant, I mean, that's great, we can do that, but we need money to do our roads. We need money to keep our buildings standing, right? Like there's just not a, a connection there. and. As much as I love when ministers come and we get to, you know, oh, welcome to the north and whatever, they don't have time when they're here to get into the nitty gritty. They're doing, they got 15 meetings every 15 minutes and they'll meet you in the face and they'll see you in an office, but that's no different than us going to Ottawa, right? And We're they want their photos. Offices. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. And then we'll have a great photo. We'll open their eyes to a bunch of things. And then so will the next meeting and the next meeting. And then, you know, it trickles in here and there, but the bigger picture of, of what we're all saying gets lost in all of us saying it at dis different times. I want to ask the jurisdiction question. Do the people of the Nuvik understand that when you talk about heating and natural gas issues, that seems like it's a more territorial and even federal level of jurisdiction. But I'm assuming you're hearing about it more than the MP or the MLA in your area. Um, do they understand the different levels of jurisdictions? And do you find that you have to, even though it's a different level of jurisdiction, you have to address these issues because you are the government of proximity to quote Scott Pierce again? Yeah, most definitely. We're like, we're the closest one to the people, right? As they say. Um, so yes, absolutely. People, well, a lot of the time, and I'm, I'm sure many people will say this, but a person just needs to be heard and you're the closest person that's been elected. So whether you can do anything about it or not, they need that voice heard. Hopefully if you know what to do with it or have the opportunity or the connection, you can send their concern on to somebody else or tell them who to go talk to. But even sometimes it's just them getting it off their chest and that's what they need. Um, so turning around and explaining to them that it's not my job or you know, in nicer terms is never going to be the way to win. Um, but being able to say, well, you know, this is really who you should be able to talk to is probably better. We're really lucky in our area. Both of our MLAs are on the ground people. They're here talking to people all the time. They open up their social media, their emails, whatever, for, for questions um, from, the, from our community. Um, our MP is also very active, easy to get a hold of, easy to talk to. The thing is, is our our MP represents our whole territory, right? I mean, we are only 42,000 people in the whole territory, but that's how many 800 and some million square kilometers of land, right? Like, so like he doesn't get up to Inuvik as much as we would like to actually have a face-to-face -face and a proper conversation. And that's not his fault. That's the way it is, right? The Yeah. I could keep going for days. So I'll I can there. imagine it's challenging, but I want to yeah. turn because I just realized we're at the half hour mark and I want okay. to make sure uh, I, 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 I could probably keep this conversation going for a good hour because it seems like you're very passionate <laughs> about your community, but I want to talk about your community and I want to talk about something that's very passionate about to me, which is tourism. Okay. 
And as I've oh, said yeah. to anyone who's ever come on this show, if you come on this show, I will be in your community. So I am making the trip from Calgary, Alberta to Inuvik later on this year. Within a year's time, I will be up in your community. <laughs> so as right someone on. who is a tourist, as someone who has listeners from across Canada and around the world, what should people do in Inuvik if they come up and visit? And what are some of the hidden gems that you want people to see? Okay, so um, in Nuvik itself is, uh, I, I, so there's only two ways to get here. You can fly or you can drive. Um, so depending on I which will be way driving. you come, <laughs> you will be driving. Okay, right on. Because I was going to say the Dempster, getting here is part of the adventure. And the Dempster is an 800 kilometer, 40 year old, 45 year old dirt or gravel road. But it's been maintained for that long. It's a good highway um and you go through two mountain passes like the visuals on the way here are stunning and then you get to our cute little town and we have what's called the igloo church which was built in the 60s it does look like an igloo um you can go for a tour there uh we have a beautiful greenhouse which is a converted curling rink um which has been was taken over in the late 90s um by a volunteer group who have developed it into I think it's about a hundred plots and community members buy their plots and then they grow things all summer under the 24 hour sunlight. Um, and they have a commercial site as well. Uh, what else do you want to see when you come here? So one of the little tidbits, Inuvik is located perfectly on the planet to receive information from satellites in space. And so we have two satellite ground stations here. Uh, one is a government facility and one is private. And at the government one, there's four dishes, 13 meter dishes, which are huge. Think the movie Contact, those kinds of dishes um, that have art installations on them. And so there's one by an Inuvaluit, sorry, Inuvaluit artist, a Gwich'in artist, a Métis artist, and a non-Indigenous artist. Um, and they welcome people to drive up to their gate and then walk in and go take pictures, look around. Uh, and so that I think is the little hidden gem that I would tell about because it's art, technology, uh, the future and progress all coming together. Um, and it's uh, just a super cool little tidbit that you won't see anywhere else, especially in the North, because we're in the perfect spot. <laughs> is that why the internet is so clear right now? Because I was just on the call with someone from Newfoundland Labrador and their internet was not this good. And I'm going, <laughs> what's going on here? Because it seems like for a rural remote community like in Nuvik, you wouldn't have like that great of quality of internet, but you have fantastic quality internet right now. So the Mackenzie fiber line runs from, I think, Lethbridge all the way to Inuvik um, for the data transfer at those two satellite sites. And so that gives us this incredible internet that we can access as residents. That's yeah. awesome. Um, after, a, after a stressful day, after a long day of the council meetings, after a long day of meetings, just doing what you do in your normal life, where do you go in the community to decompress? Is there a certain location, a park, a, a local bar that you can get to or a coffee shop that you can go and just unwind and just let it all go and just get ready for the next day? Or is it your house that uh, everyone else wants to talk about when I ask that question to municipal councillors? <laughs> So if I had to go outside of my home, <laughs> I would go, uh, there's two really great walking trails, one right in town uh, called Boot Lake Trail, one about 40 kilometers down the highway called the Gwich'in Trail, I think it is. Um, those would be two spots to really go decompress. I'm lucky enough to have a cabin on a lake, so oftentimes on weekends I'll go to the cabin um i'm not a drinker anymore but the legion does have very nice cold beverages um and they have you know a good soda water for me to enjoy and um, they're very friendly here and so it's always a good place to go to uh and then of course i want to come home i have two little doggies and recently i started a little side hustle with the um doing small dog grooming and so i get doggy time all the time and so I'm, uh, yeah, this, my home is my, my most decompressing place. But <laughs> I'm not sure if you heard it, but when you said dogs, my two dogs, just my, my dogs, I should say, just bark. <laughs> what type of dogs do you have? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I have a Cocker Spaniel named Cleo 
and a shorky, which is a Shih Tzu Yorkie cross named Milo. Oh, <laughs> uh, we have a husky and we have t- a Yorkie terrier, so we, we, okay. we so we we have a very loud house. Um, I want to end on the million dollar question for you, uh, Natasha, and that question is. What makes the town of Inuvik such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think it's probably the thing that I didn't touch on, which is our incredible mosaic or cultural fabric of people. There's two Indigenous groups that are right here in our community. We're on their land. Um, And the way that our community lives together of Indigenous folks, non-Indigenous folks, and multicultural people from around the world. Um, I think it's the people that make you want to stay um, and play and work. And that's what it is. Inuvik is the kind of place where there isn't, you either love it or you don't. There's not really an in-between. And so you stay if you love it. And if you don't, there's a flight every day in a highway. <laughs> so folks who don't like it, don't stay. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to visiting now because you've painted an amazing uh, (laughs) mural of what your community is like. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for a randomly getting back to me via email when I sent you my (laughs) message. It's always great when municipal councillors like to talk about their communities and themselves. But I want to also thank you for serving your community. I I think municipal councillors don't hear that enough, but I want to start saying that. So thank you so much for giving back to your community, for serving your community, and for being a strong advocate for your community. And I know we've only chatted for about 40 minutes, but it seems like you are the right person for the deputy mayor's job right now. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. So with that, I want to remind everyone to put down your cell phone, go have a conversation with somebody in real life, even if it's just for five minutes, it helps our democracy, helps our society. And yes, it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. We'll be back tomorrow. Till then, just keep talking.